good. But I don't. Oh, she's gone. She's just trying to log back in. Hello. Can yes, I yes. Uh, can can we wait till five or five? Yeah, yeah, sure. And sure. Uh, once uh, Manjuri's back. Okay, okay. 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 Sorry for the postponement. Uh, I to, is Devika here too? Yeah, yeah, she's here as well. Yeah, yeah. Many apologies for that. I, uh, but I, I think it was probably for the best to do. Like exhaustion has literally turned into illness now, so I'm struggling quite heavily. But I'm still struggling less than I was last Sunday. So, uh, it's okay. It's it's not something you could control either. Yeah, contact. I know. I think it was this uh, Bluetooth of the phone. This was not working of the computer. Oh. Now it's okay. Yeah. No, it was also there's there's an aspect of uh, there's an aspect of uh, uh, space communication about this whole thing. No, no matter what we do. Yeah, Murphy's yeah. law. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> Hey, Manjiri, while you were away, I was just telling Nafisa uh, our yeah. our live session for acoustics is scheduled on. 23rd and I think oh. all three of us are going to be in Dehradun that day. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. So I yes. just asked her, Nafisa was asking if a little bit earlier was okay and I was yeah. saying 18th or 19th work for me because 16th, uh, 17th is a symposium Correct. and we'll all be traveling at various points after that. So maybe 18th or 19th, would that work for you? Yeah, yeah. 18th, 19th, both are fine. Saturday, Sunday, I think, right? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't even know what date is. So. Uh, I, uh, so the lectures will be live on Monday. So I don't think Saturday, the previous Saturday or Sunday would work because the lectures uh -huh. won't be live by then. Okay. Then we may have to have them after the 6th, huh, Devika? Right. Because... Okay, after the 6th, is it? Yeah, because that's I'll be away till the 6th. I'll be getting oh. back that evening. Yeah. From okay, we can, we can discuss this over uh, How? Yeah. Uh, 21st is also, is it possible for you, Anand? Should be. I think it's okay. If it's a little okay. earlier in the day, I think I should be able to make it. Okay. Tiga, let's start. Hi, uh, welcome to this interactive live session. So, um, so if any of you have any questions or you have any doubts or want to discuss anything for week two and week three, uh, you can feel free to type in in the chat box. Oh, we have a question. Uh, oh, I think that one's for me, right? Pneumatic bones. I was going to type an answer back and then I realized you could answer ver verbally. Uh, they are not brittle. At all. Pneumatic bones may be light, but they're not actually brittle. They have a fair degree of strength. They're brittle compared to our bones, but that doesn't mean they're going to break when the bird stands up, because if they did, then the bird would not be able to stand up. Uh, so they're actually, uh, the other important thing is that they're light. So when they see they need to stand, fly or walk, they're not actually putting a lot of weight on their bones either. So the bones are pneumatized and they're lighter. But they're strong enough to take the bird's weight. And if they're swimming, obviously, there's no weight on the bones. So it doesn't really matter in that case, if that helps. Any other questions? Uh, is that also for me, Nafisa? Um, birds can see, yeah, birds can see all the colors as we do, question mark. Yeah. Um, yes and more is the long and short answer to that. They're tetrachromatic, we're trichromatic, so they can see all the colors we do and they can see colors that we cannot see. Uh, 
uh, there's also a, sorry the, um, there was a Google sheet where there are just two questions there. One is by Tepali Sharma. She asked the question, how to identify birds on the basis of beaks? How to identify birds on the basis of what? Beaks, beaks. Uh, you can't identify a bird on the basis of the beak unless they're very, very different from each other. I might not use the beak as a tool to identify the bird. Rather, I might use the beak as a, a tool to understand what the species might be doing with it. And that is the case. I think if you want to identify birds for bird watching purposes or other such things like that, then uh, mine is not the lecture that you should use as a guiding cue for that A, because my lecture is not really targeted to bird watchers. But B, uh, you want to, I mean, the beak is part of it, sure. Sometimes birds can be identified on the basis of beak, but you'll use a more holistic set of criteria to identify birds. The beak is, uh, is a feature that has an import, important consequences for the study of ornithology, anatomy, ecology, and everything else. But as an identification cue, it depends on the bird in question. You can tell a curlew apart from a godwit by its bill, but you can't tell which species of curlew or which species of godwit it is often just solely by the bill. You use a number of other criteria. I saw a few questions in chat. I'll just respond to that quickly before you go back to the Google Sheet because someone's typing quite... Oh, I can actually just read these. Thanks for pasting them. Swimming is not weight bearing for humans. I'm a retired doctor. Yes, I did say that. Uh... Why do flying birds seem to hold their thoracic region in horizontal alignment as being upright just before liftoff? This alignment doesn't seem as pronounced during landing. Do legs, feet have a role to play as well? Yes, uh, and the alignment has nothing to do with the carina. It has everything to do with when you need to lift off, you need to push against the ground. So you bend downwards and push off against the ground. And when you're landing, you need to decelerate yourself. So you will not push down or land horizontally to decelerate yourself just like a plane does. A plane cannot be aligned horizontal to the ground when it lands or it would crash. So planes, uh, it has everything to do with simple acceleration and deceleration and nothing to do with the actual carina itself. Um, Nafisa, shall I go to these next few things that you've pasted? Yeah, yeah no worries. You can. Uh, okay, so I'll just go through these four things that you pasted, right? Mm -hmm. Structural patterns that reflect brown, uh, not known. But And if they did reflect, they would probably be red. They tend not to be mixed colors. So brown is usually a melanin thing. What is the difference between body fat and brown fat? Uh, there are physiological differences. I won't go into the details here. But brown fat is very specifically related to thermogenesis and heat generating stuff. And body fat serves a number of other functions, most of which you will also hear from a dietitian or anyone else. And it's not very different for birds. What is the purpose of bristle feathers? In barbets, since it is frugivorous, ask me that question in two to three years and I'll have a good answer for you. But uh, it's not really known. It's thought to be sensory, potentially, uh, or other other ways in origin. They may also serve a protective function, like, you know, a screen of sorts, given what barbets do with their bills. But um, frugivory, and it's also important to remember that eating is not the only things birds do with their bills. Uh, for further information, look up my research. Uh, uh, four, does bird, do birds shiver? Yes, they do. Just like we do. Have I gone through all of it yet? Yep. Uh, oh, there's another one. What do you think the most important is blah, blah, blah of birds when we are facing or fighting deforestation and rapid concretization? I mean, there's a lot of different research on it. They'll probably have high cortisol levels. They'll probably have uh, various other things. Uh, you know, nutritional changes, survival changes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For reference, look up Umesh, some of Umesh Srinivasan's work. Uh, he has a bunch of work on this stuff, and he'll be lecturing you later if he's not already done so, Nafisa. Yeah, later. Hmm. So that's definitely a question that you should put to him. And if Anusha is Anusha is taking a guest lecture again this time, right? Yeah. Uh, she's her le guest lecture is done on hummingbird physiology. Oh, it's already done. Yeah, if there's an interactive session with her, then she's also a great person to write to and ask about this. There's another one. How is the trust factor among the birds? Who is that given towards? Uh, I'm not sure. How is uh, the can, trust? So, Nidhi, trust can you elaborate what you mean by trust factor? Do you mean <laughs> pair bonding or something? Um, I, I just, yeah, I just, I just, uh, so what we see in 
Anand, can you hear? Uh, no, no, uh, again? It, it's breaking. It's not really that audible. Uh, so maybe, maybe, maybe you can type. Uh, you can type because it's not clear. So while you are typing, I'll just assume what you meant was about pair bonding, whether they will remain paired, uh, assuming that the other partner will remain paired. So, of course, uh, uh, monogamy is very common in birds, but it is mostly social monogamy, which means that they remain in a pair bond, but they do seek what is known as extra pair copulations. So... Uh, if you ask me from a uh, very uh, uh, anthropogenic point of view, you know, trust factor, when you're saying you're sort of, you know, implying some anthropogenic uh, features on animals, non-human animals. So maybe we might want to avoid doing that. But uh, otherwise, from a scientific point of view, um, there is uh, no reason to think that uh, uh, the hormonal changes in birds with respect to uh, pair bonding should be any different than most other animals where um, long-term associations do have an endocrinological uh, underpinning which allows them to remain pair bonded but that does not mean that they will not seek uh, extra pair copulation so there is something called genetic monogamy which is uh, less common but social monogamy is what is more common. So even if the quote-unquote trust factor is there, they do, you know, sneak out every once in a while. I, I don't know if this is what you meant by the trust factor, but I'm just assuming. Thank you, ma'am. Um... Oh, there's another one from God of Soman. Uh, how different is the immune system in birds than mammals compared to the physiology? Is that for me? Yeah. I mean, all the things that matter is not vastly different. Uh, they still have cell-mediated and antibody-mediated immunity. They don't have like special immunity that nobody has. But depending on where a bird is or whether they're isolated they may have uh, selective losses of immunity to certain things or loss of MHC diversity, for example, which we also have. So I would argue that if you're speaking from an evolutionary perspective, we're not vastly different. That helps. So would you also like to address some of the questions from the discussion forum? Or... Yes, please. Okay. There... There's one for you uh, on the color of birds. So there's one that says, Sir, wait, I'll, actually, I'll just, I think it's better if I just paste it here. Sounds good. If the color of birds are derived from some diet, then what trait is passed on to the offsprings which enables them to attain the same color generation after generation? The metabolic steps that lead to that, uh, uh, not, not to enable them to fade or feed on the same food, but to enable them to metabolize it in the same way. Just the same way that if you can digest something, your offspring probably can as well. Uh, yeah, that's about it for that, I think. Are feeding and feeding related activities like hovering, blah, blah, blah. Whoa, there's a lot. Uh, or swimming and diving as metabolically expensive as flight. Um, some more, some less. Hovering is flight. So hovering is very energetically expensive. Swimming and diving are also energetically expensive. But the energy you get from them uh, is, is, I mean, it depends on what you're swimming or diving after versus flying after. But flight in general or anything that requires repeated motion against any sort of object is energetically expensive. And that's intuitive to understand. Swimming is energetically expensive. We do it. We can only swim so much before we lose all of our energy, right? 
So sometimes the same math that you use to decide what is going to be tiring and what is not applies to a bird as well. I think the next question is for Manjuri. Yeah, so uh, it's a very uh, interesting question. Why monogamy in birds, but not so common in mammals? Uh, you have to think of what drives monogamy. So one of the most important difference between a bird and a mammal is their reproductive system. The birds lay eggs, right? And mammals uh, give birth to live young. Huh? And in mammals, it is the females who lactate. So the primary caregiver has to be the female, right? And one can then ask why didn't mammal in mammals, why didn't the males... Uh, you know, evolved to have mammary glands. But that's a question for a different day, maybe. But if you think the female bird is actually practically carrying the egg in her and she lays the egg, once she lays the egg, so to in during that period, of course, it is possible for the male to uh, uh, seek other mates. So from the point of view of evolution of monogamy, this is a paradox. Okay, that is exactly why monogamy in birds is said to be a paradox because the males have the opportunity to defect, but uh, most of the time they don't. And the uh, general consensus is it is basically resource-driven monogamy because it takes two to raise the young ones, except for in precocial birds. Uh, in al So precocial altricial you have done. So in altricial birds, uh, since they are really dependent on the parents for finding resources, for thermoregulation and for, uh, you know, protection from uh, predators, uh, there has to be biparental care. And this biparental care has been argued to have driven monogamy. Yet, remember, this monogamy is mostly social monogamy. Okay. On the other hand, in case of mammals, the Mother is providing care, no, by providing food. So mammary glands are there only for the females. So that is in the, for the neonates. It is the food thing is taken care of. So this has been argued as one of the important differences. Uh, it's not anything to do with uh, better gene. Uh, so I'm assuming you mean uh, do mammals want to preserve their genetic uh, represent? Uh, sorry, birds preserve their genes more than mammals. It's not like that, huh? I hope. That answers the question. Can you tell what is happening in this video? Because uh, I'll have to watch this video and decipher. What are the infections? That occur if it is about infections uh, that can happen with multiple matings. So yes, of course, uh, various kinds of parasitic uh, infections can be transmitted by close contact uh, aside from sexually transmitted uh, uh, diseases, including viruses. But uh, that is one of the reasons why uh, in the lecture we also mentioned that there is female enforced monogamy where females may be enforcing the males to uh, uh, limit their extra pair uh, copulations. Also, females may be uh, actively discriminating against previously mated males to minimize infection. If that is what is happening in the video, I hope that is answered. If there is something else, please type it. Uh, there's another question of a you as yeah. well, ma'am. Yeah, lek by definition has to be a display arena which is free of resources. So, uh, even in black bucks that you have mentioned, rich in grasses, but the lek exactly where they display is typically an exposed area devoid of food resources or any other resources except for mates. So, you can actually see these lake leks even from space actually. You can see where these uh, displays happen. You may not see the black bugs, but you can see these empty grounds devoid of grasses. So in case of black bugs, but in general, the definition of lek is it is a display arena which does not have resources as in food resources or shelter. It has to be devoid of resources. Only then it will be a lek. Uh, 
Thank you. Any question? Nafisa, there is, I think, some question about if they miss the live session, how do they access it? I think the discussion forum probably is the... Yeah, uh, in case you miss the live session, uh, you can access... So the videos have already been pre-recorded and they'll be uploaded at the uh, and available at your dashboards. I can uh, send another email regarding the YouTube links which you can still have access to. Ma'am, will you be uh, addressing uh, most me, ma'am's questions as well for our week three? Uh, I'm not sure. I wasn't told to do that. Uh, in oh, okay. Advance, so I haven't really looked at it. Yeah, yeah no. Uh, there's just a question uh, that says, uh, I can type it. I can just paste it. I'm not sure who that question is directed at or where it comes from. Uh, it doesn't seem to be based on anything any of us said. Yeah, so, it, this one is uh, for most. I don't music. think when a bird starts reproducing has anything to do with when it um, produces, or how many eggs it produces. Mm -hmm. It's a much more physiological question. It's from whose lecture did you say? Uh, most me, ma'am's lecture. Uh, it's just one address to it. So I think she may have been outlining a hypothetical scenario. Anyway, then maybe someone should just ask her that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, also, uh, you know, uh, if it can be worded a little less ambiguously, mm -hmm. for example, it says bird produces one egg and produces two egg, mm -hmm. respectively, which means are there two different birds? Uh, do the, does the person mean the same bird? So kindly, uh, you know. Elaborate it and in the discussion forum, if it is posted, one of us will answer. Oh, sure. yeah. There's a special question for Manjari. What do you think, uh, Aindrila? Uh, to me, the answer uh, is, you know, it's, it's also a subjective thing, no? But it depends what uh, you think is most special, you know? For instance, what would you call the dance of the peacock? as the most spectacular uh, special courtship ritual or <laughs> or can it be some uh, birds that produce a, a variety of sounds uh, to uh, impress their females for example there are many well let's say the uh, purple sunbird has an extremely diverse repertoire of sounds but it also flashes its underarms you know its armpits uh, at the female the males uh, have uh, some very bright coloration in their armpits so is that special so it's it's uh, i would say it is a matter of aesthetics and yeah some birds do it That's pretty special, I would say.
on valentines day maybe if you ask me i might give you some other answers next week maybe yeah thankfully we didn't have that uh, this interaction on valentines day can you imagine in fact uh, anand i always give a, a special lecture if valentines day falls on a weekday i give a special lecture for my undergrads in aisar mohalli it's called singing and dancing for love Yeah. It's all about bird food. I just went to Aisar Pune and did that whole series of lectures there. So, I if see. any of those students in this class, so they'll be able to protest loudly on what they thought about that. Uh, I'm. I don't think I want to click on that link, Nafisa, to see what it is. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know what it will be. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh yes, and they yes they do. They they don't they're not susceptible typically to rotting bacteria. They have pretty good immune systems, but also they have very acidic stomachs. So I don't think a lot of things survive that. Lama guys, for instance, have stomachs that can dissolve bone. So I don't think uh, uh, pathogens are any exception to that if they're already dissolving bones. Uh, Manjay, I think the next question is for you. but i think there's two separate questions in there i don't think they're related to each other uh i have seen birds to display with their feathers on their neck and tail okay uh, i think that's more of a comment uh, in your opinion which bird has the loudest call to scare off a competitor uh, anand which was that bird no the loudest bird which the has the bell bird the prokna yes bell bird yeah yeah but they are not found in india so so oh, is the next one for me it says for anand sir ah uh, okay yes that's my eyes are blurring from this ghastly cold uh yes they can restore their coloration at the next molt and pass on to their offspring no they won't pass on the coloration but they'll pass on the capacity to store the coloration um i'm not oh. clear who the next question is for did you do foraging yeah. during mostly me did foraging but i did talk about a uh, uh, little bit of uh, parental care and things like that i mean if, uh, what do you think while foraging what should the birds avoid you know they are quite susceptible animals are quite susceptible when they are foraging because typically they have their heads down right so uh predation is a big problem and i think next uh, lecture will be on social behavior nafisa i think social behavior comes up next in which i do talk about uh, how uh, social birds uh, you know take care of this problem of foregoing foraging while they are having to keep an eye out for predators so they have some things they have uh, sentinel behavior where one of them will go up Uh, on a high branch or something to look out for predators while the rest of the group members can forage but solitary species uh, they will have to really budget for you know to keeping an eye out for predators while they are foraging so that is i would say that is something they really have very strong selection uh, for so anti predator i think the next question is also for you but uh, i think there's a lit an unfortunate spelling mistake there which means that the question could be meant for either of us uh i think one of those a's is a u to indila just saying uh before you send that you're not the first person to make that mistake but yeah that is an unintentional word that should not be in the chat but uh it is i think manjuri's question to answer because it's about courtship In fact, Anand, you should answer. No, Great Indian Bustard. What is their courtship ritual? I, I well, I have sure. seen it, so that is true. Although the person you definitely want to ask about, uh, GIBs. Okay, yeah. Let's yeah. just call them GIBs, shall we? Uh, is uh, Shrutirtha Datta the WII? Uh, because they actually work with them, and they actually lack, which Manjuri probably told you about. She probably told you about lacks. So. bustards lack or used to lack i think the population is now too small for them to lack so i think they've entirely stopped but they stand on display grounds and inflate their gular pouch and stride around with their tail held vertically like this waiting to attract females and then they court them and mate with them so yeah they do have an elab all all 
members of the OTDD have uh, courtship displays in some form of uh, polygynous mating system. That helps. The next one is thanks, Manjari. So. Also, J A R I. Here yeah, we should be an A. I have a I have a question for you, Manjari, about this foraging birds avoiding things. Do you think they also avoid bird watchers uh, so they can go eat in peace? <laughs> there are these. Is that why so few of us observe no, foraging have... birds unless, huh? You must have seen those memes, no? Here comes huh. another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I, that's, I mean, that it makes me wonder why there's so few studies on foraging, except when you've got your babblers used to you and other things like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say most of bird behavior is, uh, well, hard to observe when you are very close by unless you habituate them to your presence and, and unless they are actually very far away from you. So, like, you may be very close to the tree, but they may be in the canopy, so it's okay. But many birds forage on the ground. And since we typically, well, walk on the ground and we are rarely sitting on a branch or flying around, foraging behavior becomes, uh, you know, at close quarters hard to observe. But that is simply because we are also potential predators, no, Anand? Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm working you into my public service announcement that I'm about to make. This is why instead of listing, everyone should focus on seeing birds in detail and observing them and understanding what they do, just as Manjari has done for all these years. And uh, Suhail is going to be very upset at me about this because uh, uh, that's what they all do. No, no, I think Suhail when, will be happy, you know. While yeah, you are when, you, when you go out birding, instead of focusing on finding every species to the point where you're always, you know, like rush, 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 rush and disturbing things, pay attention to the little things because that's tomorrow's inspiration and that's where the answer to why study birds comes up. I yeah, think. also uh, like Ramana says, no, Anand, uh. that sometimes photography helps you slow down so when we are watching so i i had this discussion with him that who is a true blue i mean just diverging a little bit napisa just for two minutes yeah, we don't have and any questions true blue birder is it the one with the binox or the one with the uh, camera and i was pulling his leg for carrying such a big camera around so then his argument was and i thought that was very nice he said that you know photography slows you down so you end up observing much more than which species it is. You observe the behaviors. So I think, yeah. There I is disagree with them. I think I make more observations when I'm not carrying a camera. No, no, I'm not for the professional, but for yeah. bird watchers, when you're trying to photograph, you have to stay put in one place, right? So I think... Actually, I would argue that the down. best way to bird is without binoculars. I, I started doing that a reasonable amount in cities and all now. And the amount of things you notice when you're birding without a binocular or any such thing, you had learned to identify birds in such a different way. I don't know. Yeah, also, you know, behavior, for instance, like binoculars are very useful and handy. Yeah. But uh, for behavior and yeah, we have a interpretation, yeah. uh, you need to see what is happening in the surroundings. And oftentimes, and in fact, typically, you will not be able to see that with the binocular or the camera. So you need to take that thing device off your eyes and you know just look around what's going on because it's the bird may be making well. a lot of calls it may be directed towards a mate but it could be directed towards a predator and you would not know unless you take that out and look around so yeah i agree with that we have a we have a comment that says bird watchers are very good people they only watch birds they don't gamble or smoke uh i wish i i really wish that were true. I'm sure bird watchers are all prone to all the same numbers of vices as any of the rest of humanity are. But, uh, and I wish it was a replacement hobby rather than an additional one. But uh, by 99.99% by, uh, of bird watchers are indeed quite good people, I must say. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, I, 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 the same can be said of ornithologists. Uh, we're all good people, but we're also all prone to, I mean, most of the same vices as anyone else's. Uh, I would argue uh, to Gaurav Soman, who put in that comment, that picking the best spots may either require you to get study their behavior up close or may uh, induce you to cause large amounts of disturbance that actually are much more harmful than you may think. So it's not as uh, black and white as that. Let me put it that way. I think... Uh, 
picking the best spot depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to study the bird, you're going to do something very different. If your goal is, I want to show off on social media, you may be doing much more harm than you think you're doing. And that's uh, this thing. I'm very, yeah, you'd be surprised. Avoiding disturbance may not be as obvious as you think because you don't know what disturbs the bird. That's what Manjari just said. Man, without study, without behavior, and in fact, without ornithologists, you might not know these things, which is why I think it's important that people taking courses like this actually listen uh, to diverse viewpoints, which is how this course is constructed. Because birders... yeah, For example, we know that nest or photography is bad, that everybody agrees to. But it is not just nest photography that is bad. Even during courtship, you know, when uh, we uh, interrupt by our own presence, simply our presence to close quarter, no matter how big your tele lens is, it disrupts. You must, I mean, most uh, very uh, observant bird watchers would have noticed that you can disrupt many kinds of behavior, not only their nesting behavior when you are taking photographs. So I think the ethics of photography, I'm sure most bird watchers do think about it. But like Anand said, sometimes these courses also open your eyes and ears to things that you may not have thought uh, can be potentially uh, something that the birds care about. Someone's asked a question about playbacks. Sometimes... Oh, uh, oh there is a lot of work. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of work. We know that this stresses out the birds. In fact, people, researchers have actually measured <laughs> hormonal levels. They have looked at behavior. So playbacks do stress out the birds. It also disrupts their behavior. It can also make them susceptible to predation. So, I mean, I think it is more of an obvious answer that is definitely extremely bad. Playbacks is an absolute no-no for anything except for serious research, even for which we get explicit forest department permits to conduct playback. You cannot do playbacks if you don't have forest department permits. People do it. Researchers all over the world may be doing it also, but it is unethical. If you are going to do playback as part of your research, you must have got forest department permits to conduct playback. So yes, it is a very big problem, not only for uh, their uh, you know behaviors getting disrupted, it can actually cause fatal uh, uh yeah it can be fatal for birds it can cause nest failure and various other things too it's not um unusual for that to happen and the only correct way to observe a nest involves uh um, like a very very long preparatory period to build hides and other things like that and even that requires a careful permit process which is uh quite tightly regulated so researchers follow a number of regulations when doing things, even when using playback on surveys and other things like that. Those regulations frequently don't apply to tourism, but uh, the negative effects on birds are well documented. And the feeders in a backyard cities, uh, in backyards or in, in cities is a complex thing, but many, many Western countries do it and they've proven to be remarkably successful in terms of actually monitoring and supplementing bird populations in an area. So I would urge you to look... Uh, at the extensive feeder literature in the United States, but also Australia in particular, uh, for the effects that feeders and artificial nest boxes both can have. Just to add to that, there are studies that have shown that feeders are also sites for transmission of parasites, where, you know, because the birds are coming to the same location in large number frequently and also, you know, uh, typically concentrated in a very small space, there's a lot of disease transmission that happens at the feeder. So that can be a potential problem. But, you know, there's, as everything else, there are pros and cons. For instance, in the winters, if you are going to provide additional, uh, fo you know, food to the birds, of course, they're going to come. Maybe you will be supporting. But what if you, I mean, I've seen this happen, Anand, here. People feeding them aloo parathas. Imagine what horror it is, no? what it is doing to the bird with all that oil and everything that is going in. So one has to be careful not only how your feeders are placed, but also what is going in that feeder. Yeah, you may be vegetarian, many birds may not be. Hey, Nafisa, if there are no more direct questions about the lectures either here or in the discussion forum, should we start sort of winding this down? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
in in case any of the students have any questions, you can even unmute and ask. I think if that's okay with both of you. Why did it's not chaos? Uh, yeah. yeah, may I? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You can hear me well? Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is regarding sparrows that visit my home. So I've seen it for them at times that if one of them flew away, rest of them follows them. And another thing is that uh, at times, many of them, like uh, when we step in into, that, into the area where they are sitting and eating, few of them still sit and eat, rather rest of them flew away. So uh, this is the trust that I was asking about. Like how come few of them, they sit there and eat, rest of them flew away? So I'll try to answer this uh, in a uh, simple way. There are two things. One, of course, there is something called eavesdropping in which they pick up information. Social information is picked up by just watching others what they are doing. Sparrows are not social, they are gregarious. But even then, they can see what others are doing and respond accordingly. But there are personality differences in animals, not only in vertebrates, but also in invertebrates, where there are going to be some that are bolder and some which are less uh, uh, bold. So uh, they are more likely to get disturbed easily, while some other individuals might not. Even between species, across species, you can see personality differences. All of you who may have... Uh, observed a paddy field pipet would know what I mean by a bold bird. It's a very small bird, but it is quite bold. It will not easily get flushed out. On the other hand, if you were anywhere close to a wagtail, it would fly away easily. Thank you. Can I say something? Sure, sure. Uh, I just actually last time I appreciated a teacher. So maybe you all are very busy. You don't have time. So I don't know. So those taken as comments because you allowed me to speak. I want to say that Anand sir, your lecture was very good. And I'm 68 years old and I enjoyed your lecture. And uh, don't take it amiss. You've lost weight. So you're obviously sick. <laughs> I'm a retired OBGYN who did not see birds in Manipal for 30 years. But because I joined a bird watcher group. I actually see birds and I'm enjoying the course because now I'm learning the science of birds. Giving this opportunity to, I conduct deliveries all my life and now I'm reading about birds and thank you very much. I just wanted to say thank you. It's very exciting for me to go online and enter for the exam. I could not, oh, they were asking questions, how do you upload photos? And obviously I'm a teacher, so I'm little, why are they asking these questions? But yesterday, Nafisa, I had a very tough time. It took me 10 hours to upload the photo just because I'm old, but I uploaded, I have written for the exam and I'm studying well. And I just want to say thank you very much. And I couldn't do razor pay. So my son did raise a pay and I just want to say thank you to everybody because my son studied in IIT, my father studied in ISC and I had this dream as a doctor to do PhD in IIT. So if you can write this exam in ornithology, my wishes will be fulfilled and I want to say thank you to the bottom, from the bottom of my heart to all you teachers for giving us this one hour of live sessions and chance to interact. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome and you're far too kind, of course. <clears throat> both for um, uh, both for the appreciation, I I I would be very grateful, and for saying that I've lost weight. You may be the first person in the last five years uh, to say anything resembling that to me. Most people are anticipating that I will leave a crater anytime I put my foot down these days. But uh, no, sir, you, you use the for... chalk, you use the blackboard, right? That's why it was so exciting. Well, that was also recorded. That was also recorded a couple of years ago now, but uh, at my previous job, in fact. But uh, I, I do strongly believe in using chalkboard lectures. I know that a lot of people who take this course don't like it, but uh, I do strongly believe in it, no matter what the opportunity. Uh, Manjari and I have taught together over the years, so we also know what works together and what doesn't and what comes better one after the other. So this is now something we no longer even have to discuss with each other to do. Because if Manjari knows she's going after me or I know I'm going after Manjari, we just automatically know where the other person will have left off. It's and Maushimi had told, Maushimi had told something about the birds and their lifespan, the number of 
eggs they were producing. So some of that was probably, that's why the question was not clear. It was just based on what Ma Maushmi was no, teaching. No, 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 no. And I'm, I'm glad to hear it too. As a, like I said, I only wish bird watcher, we uh, ornithologists and bird watchers were all as... Uh, uh ni nice as you say we are i we i think we're all just human beings just like anyone else just doing a very different thing but it's really nice to hear that and i also will say thank you on nafisa's behalf for uh for things that you've been saying to her i know she's been enjoying the experience a whole lot as well and uh you know we're all we're all still learning every single one of us is still learning including nafisa so uh and and myself and manjuri so it's very nice of you to say that as well. But uh, there are... And I'm sorry for... I'm sorry for... Because you gave us me a chance to speak. I was born in 1956 in Dehradun. So... And I lived 16 years there. And my father took me bird watching and told me about Sadi Mali. So I know you three are going to Dehradun. Have a nice time. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there the are questions for you. There's a yeah. couple of questions, and I think both of them are for you. Uh, so I don't know if anybody has researched whether I, I, I snacks or alu paratha is bad for birds, but um, I can tell you there's a lot of work which shows the harmful effect of uh, feeding uh, wild animals. And I would uh, so there are amongst bird watchers, there are like absolutely clearly two sides, some who are very strongly in favor of bird feeding, some who are absolutely against it. But we know that, uh, uh, you know, uh, feeding wild animals can result in uh, various kinds of problems, obesity being one, but also uh, them uh, coming to the roads. For example, a lot of work by Meva Singh on uh, the primates has shown that this causes fatality. But for birds, um, it, it can still be a, a problem because the kind of food, anthropogenic food that we give has a lot of, you know, it can have ghee, it can have oil, all of which are unnatural. It is not something the birds are used to. It can uh, disrupt their molting. It can cause all kinds of infection. So yes, there is problem, but that is not to say that, you know, if you throw some grains at sparrows, it's going to be a problem. So it's not black and white. Uh, about the crows, whether they are disappearing or not, there is a State of Indian Birds report, which I think is uh, really downloadable, Anand, right? So, Hale's uh, that thing. So, I think you can download that and you can see whether the crow population is stable or not stable. I'm not quite sure. Uh, for instance, in Aisar... About it. Okay. Uh, at least in Aisar yeah. Mohali, for instance, uh, we never had crows 10 years ago. Uh, and now we have so many crows that there are people writing emails to me that what can we do to reduce the number of crows that we have on campus. So it depends where you are. Uh, if if there is a place where you have been observing crows for many years and you have seen that the numbers have gone down and you have quantified it, then maybe it is worth investigating. We've on, uh, answered most of the questions. In case there are any left, uh, you can speak and ask. Yeah, they can send them further on the discussion forum. And yeah, 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 yeah. People yeah. just pass them on to me. What people used to do typically was if there's anything offline after the interaction session, you could put them on a doc and I'll just reply to them there. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just, if there are any more, I'll just compile them everything and then. So people may get late or whatever reason that is. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Thank you uh, to everyone for coming. So many people showed up too. It's, it's pretty lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks and, to uh, so many. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to you both as well. I know you're both pretty busy, but still. No, no. We're happy. And I'm just feeling bad that I ended up including Manjuri's interaction session like this. No, no, no. Not at all. And uh, Anand, I'm I'll just, see uh, you there. What can I say? I'm just a fan. <laughs> yeah. uh, I didn't I didn't bring my flag and my foam fingers, but I should have. I'll bring them to Dehradun <laughs> instead. More more discussions in Dehradun. Yes, Very yes, fun. yes. We have a the Manjuri fan club has a flag. Hey, Chumai, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well.
Well, Thank it's good you. to see you all. Good to see everyone. And of course, always good to see you, Nafisa. So, hey, look, Anand, uh, look at the comment section. Who says Sorry. what? <laughs> I consider that an insult. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you, whatever. <laughs> what? I don't know where you're getting this, but thank you. Uh, what? That's just made my week. <laughs> no, thank you all for coming. And uh, I hope we were helpful, especially with my yeah. nose running like a faucet. So, <laughs> well, thanks everybody and for coming. I'm and sure Manjuri was helpful. Time. I just hope I was. <laughs> hey, thank you so come much. On. Yeah. We yeah. always, you know, light up the conversations. So, yeah. Like a fire, no? Like a bonfire. <laughs> it just goes up in smoke. <laughs> Okay. Right. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank everyone. you so much. Thanks. Bye, bye. Bye. Bye, bye everyone. Bye. And bye to Devika. She's still around. Uh she left like early. She had some work. That's why. Awesome. Okay. See you, Thank Mithisa. you so much, Anand. Bye bye. Not at all. Bye.